Hello everybody, I'm uh, Sofia Gisasma, research scientist at the, the French National Institute for Agriculture Research and I'm going today to talk about additive manufacturing. Uh, among the large number of topics that we can uh, have uh, on this type of technology, I'm going to focus on uh, some limits and opportunities uh, about uh, additive manufacturing. Um, before going any further, let me uh, give you um, a small definition or simple definition uh, for additive manufacturing. Um, it's uh, known as a 3D printing for the, the public, but we can define it as uh, the manufacturing of parts or a product uh, based on a digitalized model. And uh, we use uh, the layering of uh, uh, the structure to achieve a three-dimensional uh, feature. So basically, there is only one uh, single step between uh, the digitalized model. Here is the, uh, the CAD model. CAD for stands for Computer Aided Design. And this CAD model is uh, transferred into the set of machine instruction, instructions before printing the part. So there's basically one fabrication step. And there is really weak dependence uh, on, on the fabrication tool. Here are some of the key facts uh, or the main features of uh, additive manufacturing. I think that one of the most striking thing in additive manufacturing is that it can be applied to almost everything. And you can see different applications in the, um, uh, in the area of consumer products, in bioengineering, in aerospace, in car industry, in, in any different area of, uh, of engineering. The second feature uh, about additive manufacturing is the design complexity that you can achieve, uh, you can see, by um, uh, allowing the, the, the control of the material, uh, the position, uh, point by point in the three-dimensional space. The uh, third interesting feature about the additive manufacturing is that this local control of uh, the structuring of the material allows you to combine different types of materials. You can see here the example of the toothbrush, which is uh, uh, manufacturing uh, using uh, polyjet. Uh, you put to here a, a stiff material and on the top a more flexible one. And also you can adjust the amount of material that you can put inside the pot. Uh, you can see here you can put some uh, polished structure in the, in, in the middle and uh, on the periphery some uh, solid um, material to uh, bring some more uh, mechanical stability. The other thing uh, interesting about um, additive manufacturing is the fact that you can bridge different length scales. So you can see here the example coming from uh, University of Cranfield where the guys uh, hacked the, um, the use of art welding to, uh, to do some 3D printing of large scale structures, uh, metal structures by the way. And uh, you can also uh, use similar type of technologies to uh, design uh, small features as small as uh, micrometer uh, scale. Uh, it's also uh, interesting technology, especially for the, um, manufacturing, the remote manufacturing of products. So imagine that uh, you're in an area where there is uh, um, a lack of uh, plants and you need to repair some, some parts, uh, you can send the CAD model remotely and uh, print the, the, the feature of the facility. So these are some of the basic uh, features. Let's uh, come to the uh, some challenging point for uh, additive manufacturing. The one uh, that goes in the first position is uh, the balance that you need to search between the fine resolution the control of uh, the material deposition of really small scale and uh, of the large scale, uh, the, 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 the part scale. So this is really um, uh, basic, uh, basically uh, a limitation that probably will uh, have some issues for the productivity compared to some other technologies like extrusion or, or, or molding. Um, some of these technologies are known to have some problems of accuracy and the geometry, uh, defects and finishing states. The defects will have some uh, effect on the performance. Maybe. 
basically mechanical performance of the parts, and we can see in the literature drops of like 20% of the strength or stiffness depending on the type of technology you're using. Uh, because it's also a fast-growing technology, there is a lack of uh, support toolings for uh, the optimization and lack of standards and, uh, and regulation. Uh, now I'm going to show you some snapshots of uh, basic achievements in, the, um, in the, the area of additive manufacturing. And I'm going to start with an example here in Nantes. This is a, a house that was built using a 3D printer at the larger scale. Actually, the printer was not used for printing the concrete itself, but the mold that is used to make uh, more complex shapes. You can find also um, additive manufacturing in structural materials. And you have here a quite nice example of a, a bike that was uh, the manufacturing using a biosourced material. It's also used for deco features, and you can uh, see uh, an example here for coming from the Academy of Design in Eindhoven, uh, where guys uh, printed uh, some features for the CD. Uh, additive manufacture has really strong effect, uh, impact on, on biomedical devices. Uh, this is uh, an example of a, a baby that was saved by uh, the use of a 3D printed material, a biosourced material uh, device, which was uh, deployed inside his body. Um, 3D printing is also used in electronics or in the flexible electronics, where you can um, combine um, more um, isolating and, and conductive materials. It's also used uh, for the biotech. This is an example coming from TU Delft, where um, researchers uh, use the bacteria roots to design, uh, to manufacture actually uh, a graphene uh, using a bio ink, which is a combination of uh, E. coli and alginate gel. Uh, in bioengineering, probably is the biggest hit right now. Uh, the bio um, printing market is estimated $2.7 billion, and with the key uh, interest in regeneration of tissues and organs, uh, the uh, manufacturing of medical devices, and, and so on. In food industry, uh, it can be also used uh, for a two major um, two major area for the personalized diet and for the aesthetics. You have here an example of 3D printer based on the pasty food, and uh, it's quite interesting technology to uh, manufacturing uh, to manufacture or to design food actually. These were some of the examples that can, you can find in the internet about uh, the achievement of 3D printing. Uh, now I'm going to uh, speak more about the set of technologies of uh, additive manufacturing. One of the, um, uh, let's say, the popular technology is uh, what we call the fusion deposition uh, modeling. Uh, this uh, technology works like a standard printer. Uh, you have here uh, the printer head. Uh, and there is a filament of uh, a polymeric material that goes inside this uh, this head. It is uh, heated and uh, fused and um, deposited uh, in in the base. The base is allowed to move in the, the z direction, what we call the building direction, and you have the printing head that goes in x and y direction. So this technology is really cheap, but it has some drawbacks, like the low productivity on the small volume that you can print, typically of the order of 100 millimeter. Uh, this is another technology based on what we call the selective laser melting. Instead of having uh, a filament, we have here a powder bed, and you have a laser that strikes the surface. It throws some patterns, and it um, melts uh, locally the metal. And then you sweep another layer of the powder and it, you build uh, the, the second layer and so on. Um, there's another uh, technology which is uh, more or less similar. It's called the direct material deposition. And here, instead of having a powder bed, the powder and the laser are uh, come together into the nozzle. This technology is really uh, popular to repair parts, but also to produce some really fine uh, structure. It has a good productivity, but the, the 
the cost, it goes with the, the, uh, the, the energy source that is used, which is here in the laser. Um, you can find different other uh, types of um, uh, added manufacturing technologies, and people are um, used uh, generally ranking depending on the type of energy that is used or uh, basically the type of material that, uh, that is uh, used. But uh, today I'm going to uh, give you a quite different ranking of the technologies based on what we call the material discontinuities. Uh, of course, if you look at the part here, the collection of uh, uh, some of the technologies that are used for additive manufacturing, these will not produce the same type of discontinuity. If you look at the stereolithography, it's probably one of the best choices to produce uh, bulky materials with uh, a less amount of uh, discontinuity. And this discontinuity increases here for the SLS or SLM, where you can see evidence of the layering structure. So basically, uh, there will be some weak links between the, the layers. Uh, if you go to the fused filament, you add another discontinuity in the plane where you put the, the, the filament. And if you go to the droplet based technologies, of course, you increase the discontinuity to three dimensional one. Uh, I'm going to focus in the uh, few coming slides on two main technologies, fused filaments and stereolithography. So let's um, uh, talk about st stereolithography uh, as a first uh, technology. Uh, these are some of the main steps that you need before uh, manufacturing uh, uh, occurs. Uh, you start by converting the CAD model into a slicing step. But before, if you uh, have a complex part with some holes inside, you need some what do we call the support material that is added to, to before, prior to the slicing. And the slicing here is used to um, uh, to set the trajectories for the laser that strikes the surface and polymerizes the material. Uh, here is um, a three-dimensional view showing uh, the solid parts here and the air structure. And you can see clearly the discontinuities here, which are related to the support material. If you look at um, a three-dimensional view of the support structure, it appears like a columnar structure here. and uh, if you look at the amount of uh, solid that is used for the support material, it's pretty small. It represents less than 1% of uh, the total uh, porosity that you intend in, in the structure. And of course, the amount of pro, uh, support goes with the complexity of the shape that you, uh, you, you plan. For example, here you have the largest amount of support in, in the structure. Good. Um, now we have uh, in the fourth and the fifth uh, um, steps, the, the manufacturing step in itself. Uh, here you have a, um, a photograph showing the liquid cuisine. Here uh, the laser will strike the surface. It throws some patterns. These patterns will solidify, actually, the, 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 oh, sorry, uh, polymerize the, 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 the resin. And then uh, you go through, um, and uh, sorry, before going to the electros, uh, ultrasonic cleaning, you have um, the plat mold that moves up, then you have a liquid uh, on the top, the laser strikes again, and it builds the second layer and so on till you get the three-dimensional feature. After that, you need to do some ultrasonic cleaning and post-curing to make sure that the part is uh, polymerized properly. So, uh, this technology is really interesting uh, if you want to have a good rendering uh, of the part, but it has the basic uh, drawback of uh, requiring a photosensitive uh, polymer. So, uh, and in order to uh, check the rendering of this structure, we can use uh, different types of imaging technique. The one that is really robust for, uh, for additive manufacturing is called the X-ray microtomography imaging. Um, the, 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 the principle of this technique is really simple. Uh, you have here um, X-ray source uh, that deliver a beam of uh, X-rays. The X-rays uh, goes through the sample, strikes you the detector, and based on the relative change in the density, you'll get some radiographic image here. And then uh, you rotate the sample, and then you get another radiographic image until you make a 360-degree uh, rotation. 
So this is uh, how a polymeric structure that is designed using sterile lithography looks like. This is the path. This is the image from X-ray tomography. As you can see, there is really limited amount of uh, uh, defects, voids, or micro micro bubbles, if you, if, you can, if you can say, inside the structure. But if you want to design more complex uh, features, you can he see here uh, some of the floating of the resin inside the porous structure it is closed. And uh, probably this is one of the drawbacks of this technology if you want to design structures that are really uh, closed, probably contain pro closed processes, you expect that there is some uh, uh, resin floating inside, inside this porous. You have also uh, some uh, residual support uh, structure that is inside uh, the, the material. This support is uh, prevents actually the collapsing of the structure during the processing. And um, this uh, structure has no really uh, structural effect uh, from the mechanical viewpoint. You can see here from the simulation result, there is uh, no load transfer transmitted to the support material, which stays in blue color indicating that uh, the amount of support is not really uh, adding to, to the mechanical performance of the structure. Uh, if we are interested in uh, knowing more about the mechanical performance of uh, the stereolithography, we do some mechanical testing. This is an example of the compression testing with the obs um, camera observation. Is um, Typical video animations showing the compressive uh, response of uh, polymeric structures as a function of the porosity uh, inside. As you can see, there is uh, uh, evidence of brittle uh, behavior of, of the infrastructure. If you look at the uh, performance of the material in different directions, x, y, and z directions, uh, probably this is one of the best uh, technology to allow what we call the isotropic uh, behavior. That means that if you test the material in the three-dimensional space, you're going to have the same the same uh, response. Now let's move to the fused deposition modeling. This is a, another type of technology uh, based on the film fused filament. This is a printer that is uh, a used to uh, print different polymer uh, um, uh, structures. It's called the, the MakerBot replicator too. Um, uh, there's some different characteristics that comes with this printer, parameters that you need to set before uh, printing uh, feature. Uh, you have here a view of the printing head. Uh, the printing head has uh, different types of uh, nozzles that have uh, uh, resolutions from typically 0.1 to 0.4 millimeter. Uh, you need to specify the layer thickness. If it's uh, 0.2, that means that you're going to have a more sticky, more cohesive structure uh, if you use it with a 0.4 millimeter nozzle. You, you, you need also to specify the infill percentage uh, if you want to have a full fully dense material or an airy structure inside the pot. And um, you have also to, to uh, decide on the type of the layouts. Uh, usually, the printer uh, gives you uh, uh, the, 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 the opportunity to change the orientation of the sample. Uh, plus 45, minus 45 means that the, the layout will be uh, all the filaments are crossed in um, by 90 degrees, and uh, if you move the the, uh, the path to uh, by a different angle, you're going to have a different layouts as well. You need to specify the printing temperatures, uh, which goes uh, typically from 210 to 255. It, uh, the printing uh, goes to 260 degrees as a maximum to print printing temperature. And um, something that is um, really uh, important is the use of what we call the rack. These are the, basically the first layers that you need to put before printing actually the part you're interested in. So these layers are really important to make the cohesive um, cohesion between the printing base and, and the part itself. And it allows also to control the planity of, uh, of the structure. 
uh, with this uh, type of technology you can print different types of materials. Uh, I indicated here the prices on the market of some of them, the PLA, PTG, and uh, if you need uh, to print materials with uh, some reinforcement, like the PLA with the wood, perhaps you need to spend more more, uh, more money. And uh, uh, typically, for example, the nylon, it's uh, one of the, the, the best, I mean, um, uh, filaments for uh, for uh, strength uh, uh, in a for for this type of uh, machines. Um, before going to uh, some details, I, I want to emphasize on some criteria for the uh, uh, for the FDM. We have here a typical sketch showing the uh, printer um, working uh, sketch. You have here the feedstock uh, filament that comes in the, the form of a wire. Uh, this filament is uh, driven by uh, pinch rollers before going to the liquefier that reduces its uh, dimension and also um, it comes at the end by the, uh, uh, the fusion state. So typically if you want to uh, make sure that your Polymer is printable. Uh, the force that you apply on the filament should not overcome the filament blocking force. But at the same time, it should be larger than the pressure drop in the liquefier. So this gives you uh, uh, a first criterion for printability, which is based on the ratio between the uh, Young's modulus and the uh, parent viscosity. Another criterion is based on the thermal response or thermal uh, behavior of the filament inside the liquefier. It goes from a vitreous state to uh, some fused state here, and uh, the temperature at which this transition occurs is called the glass temperature or glass transition temperature. So basically, the printing temperature should be larger than this glass temperature, but it should be lower than the temperature of thermal degradation. Let me show you here in the infrared recording showing how the filament um, uh, thermal behavior uh, comes uh, with uh, uh, the copolyester example here, which is printed 255. If you look at the temperature just uh, at the exit of the nozzle, it's uh, something about 170 degrees Celsius, and 40 millimeters below it drops to 71 degrees Celsius. So this means that there is a large drop in temperature, which is about 33 degrees per millimeter. So this makes uh, the thermal cycling inside the, uh, the, the building, uh, the building part is really a huge issue for uh, the um, manufacturer. Uh, we use also X-ray microtomography also to investigate the type of defects we have in, inside the structure. Um, what you can see here clearly uh, in comparison to the uh, stereolithography is that you have a layering up of, uh, uh, of the structure. And inside the structure, you have a com quite regular grid of porosity, which is created by the uh, raster of the filament trajectory. So basically, uh, with the solid material here, you expect to have a large amount of porosities. But this is not really the case. The, uh, the amount of porosity is uh, like 5%, but the most important feature here is that pore connectivity is really important. It's up to 85%. And this is due to the fact that the manufacturing is uh, based on regular uh, layering of, of the filament. FDM or fused deposition molding is really sensitive to the orientation. So if I, uh, for example, manufacture the path in this orientation uh, indicated by theta equals zero, we are not going to have the same performance as uh, the ones that are printed with theta equal 30, 45, or 60 degrees. And this is because uh, if you look at the uh, porosity inside the structure, you can see that there is uh, uh, a um, a correlation between the filament crossing and the porosity uh, generated in, within the, the, the path. If you look at the data, you have here the orientation of uh, the, uh, the, the path from 0 to 90 degrees. You see that the amount of porosity is really changing really slightly. 
But the most important feature is that, that the connectivity between the positives changes a lot between uh, the orientations. And this has really an important consequence on the mechanical performance. Let's compare a two uh, printed structure uh, with a zero degree and 30 degree and see the figure. Um, let me run this again. You can see here clearly that the compression response is not the same. For the zero degree, you can see clearly the appearance of uh, some shearing. And for the 30 degree, you are not going to, to have the same response. If you look at the uh, mechanical response in terms of stress as a function of the strain, you can see that the one with the zero degree, uh, which has um, some issues with um, the shearing, uh, that is uh, some damage occurring in, this, in, the, in the structure, where the 30 degree case, uh, you're not going to have the same, the same response. So typically, you change the orientation, you change the mechanical response. To explain what's going on inside the structure, you know, we can see here X-ray microtomography images showing the porosity inside the structure at the, uh, of the deformed structures. And you see uh, here the evidence of the damage. So um, on the right here, you have simulations that shows the uh, regions where you have a large uh, strain uh, in, in the structure. For the case of the zero degree, you can see that these uh, red color regions connect, and this is probably the, uh, the reason for the shearing occurring inside the structure. But if you look at 30, 45, or 60 degree, these regions end up at the compression uh, field where there is no connectivity between the porosity, and this explains why we get the different uh, mechanical results. If we try to print uh, um, uh, area structures, that like the one you see here, it's a PLA structure. Uh, we see that there is uh, an amount of generated porosity inside uh, at the, the structure that bridges with the porosity intended in, in the part. So uh, with that, we see different types of defects. We see uh, local defects related to the limited resolution of the printed nozzle. Uh, you see here there's some missing uh, solid material. We see some roughness inside, and we see some support material trapped inside the structure as well. If we look at some of the data, uh, here's the comparison between the porosity content that is intended and the real one that is measured. Of course, if, the, if you want 0%, we, we cannot get rid of the porosity generated by the filaments. But uh, the difference when we increase porosity level stays really small. Uh, but the most important uh, feature here is that the connectivity that is generated by bridging this intended porosity and the generated one is pretty huge. It, it represents up to 99%. Now, as a conclusion, um, I showed you some of the, um, some of the additive manufacturing processes. Uh, some of them uh, do really uh, an exceptional rendering, but there is some limitation on the type of material that you can use. Uh, and some others provide you with a large number of materials that you can uh, print, but uh, the rendering is not quite really uh, interesting. So there is uh, not unique um, printing um, technology for, uh, for, what, uh, you, for your needs. And you need to make sure that you select the right technology for the right scale and the right uh, use. Uh, the second important conclusion is that um, uh, the defect is really what is, uh, is the challenging issue in additive manufacturing. And probably it's one of the major issues that people are working on. And uh, we can see that um, if you, type of technology that you use will not generate the same type of defect. It's really dependent on, on the energy that is used on the type of uh, um, deposition that is uh, used uh, with the, for, for the process. But um, people are working on improving the situation, especially uh, the mechanical uh, performance, which is related to the amount 
of the fact that you can control or lower in, in the structure and uh, cohesiveness is really the key challenge in this unit here to uh, improve the, uh, the mechanical performance. Um, the other conclusion that we can um, give here is that um, if you want to control uh, the material properties of the printed parts, you need to understand how the rheological and thermal properties um, are um, uh, goes with the, the type of technology you're interested in to achieve the best performing uh, uh, structures. Uh, this was uh, uh, a few uh, I mean, topics about additive manufacturing, and um, I will uh, be happy to uh, answer any question if there's any uh, concern about uh, or any unclear uh, aspect uh, about what I said. Thank you very much for your attention. I'm ready to take your questions.